of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things ha happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day.
and he remembered that his son's classroom should have been in the back right corner of the school. Remembering his promise that no matter what, I will be there for you. This man began to dig through the road. And you see him, he's digging furiously. And while he's doing it, other parents show up clutching their hearts saying, my son, my daughter. But as they're watching him dig, many parents grabbed him, try to pull him off of the rubble, pull him off of his digging. And they said to him, it's too late. It's no use. What are you doing? They're already dead. Come on now. Face reality. There's nothing you can do. You're just going to make things worse for yourself. When they got done with all of that talking, he looked at them and said quite sarcastically in this word, are you going to help me now? It was like you just wasted your breath. Are you going to help me dig? If not, the parents just backed up. And all this talking, the parents left. And he was left alone, digging stone by stone through the rubble. Then the fire chief showed up. And when the fire chief got there, he said, come on, uh, it's dangerous. Fires are happening. Explosions are happening all over. You can be hurt. Come on, let us deal with this. You come on, we're going to take you home. When the fire chief got done, he looked at him and said, are you going to now start helping me dig? And then all of a sudden the fire trucks were there. They said they were going to take care of it. But the fire trucks left and the man was left alone. Then the police came and said, you're angry, you're distraught, but come on, let us take you home. There's nothing else you can do. Everybody else is leaving. And the man looked at the police and said, are you going to help me now? And then the police left. And the man was alone digging 12 hours. 24 hours, 36 hours. On the 38th hour, he lifted a boulder and heard the voice of his son. He said, Dad! And he said, Armand! He called his son name real loud. He said, Dad, I knew you were come. I told the other kids not to worry. I told them that if you were alive, that you would come and save me, and they would be saved when you came to save me. And here you are. You did it, Dad. I told them not to worry. You made a promise, no matter what, that you would be there for me. And the dad just smiled and said, come on out of there, son. He said, well, look, dad, there's 14 of us left of the 33 that were in the room. When the, when the earthquake hit, it made like a ledge and a triangle, and we were safe underneath of the other boulders. He said, well, we're scared, we're hungry, we're tired, but we're alive now and so happy to see you. Thank you for keeping your promise. And then his dad said, well, come on, let me get you out of there. He said, don't get me first, dad. Get the other kids. I know you're going to get me because you never let me down. You made me a promise. This is a true story. But it also, this father demonstrated the love and faith that this father had in keeping his promise, the faithfulness of the father. This young man is demonstrating or represents how we are supposed to act. No matter if the earth falls in, no matter what happens in our life, we are to trust that God is going to be there. That's the essence of this message. So you understand that no matter what happens in your life, God is going to keep his promise. He is going to keep the promises he made to you as things change. We are in the midst of a pandemic. We're in the midst of a world that's changed. We're in the midst of work is different. Jobs are different. The economy is different. Our houses are different. Our churches are different. And some of us are going through a lot of mental stress and problems. But can I assure you this morning? Can I tell you don't worry? Because there's one thing you can be assured of based on this text. And that is our God never changes. The eighth verse of this 13th chapter is a verse we'll single on, which is part of our subtext. Look what it said. Very important words. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that powerful? Everything around us changes. Found 
foundations give way, but God never changes. Circumstances don't change God. Trouble doesn't change God. Where we are doesn't change God. What I'm saying to you is he won't break his promise. Same God, same power, no matter what is going on. Our God is going to be faithful to us. The same power that kept you before this pandemic, the same power that kept you before you were sick, the same power that kept you is the power that's going to keep you. Our God is the same. It takes power to be the same. None of us can say we're the same, but God is so per perfect in his divinity that he does not have to change. He has no reason to change. He has all power in his hands. He has everything you need. Can I tell somebody to shout it out? God has everything that you need. The Bible tells us quickly, you can peruse the Bible everywhere you look, it tells you my God is a God that doesn't change. Malachi 3 and 6. He said, I am the Lord who changed not, and it's because I don't change that you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. I know that's not news to anybody, but the only reason you have not been consumed is because God has not changed. What it means is when I was changing, when you were falling, when we couldn't make it, God was the same and he held us while we were trying to be scared and fearful. God said, the only reason, listen to me, that you haven't been consumed is because I don't change. The Lord, I change not. James 1, 17 says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of light, where there lights, where there is no variableness of changing. Look at what God says. I've been given every good and perfect gift, and you can depend on somebody on a shower right here for them to keep on coming because God doesn't change his mind. I'm glad he don't change his mind based on my foolishness. I'm glad he don't change his mind based on the best based on the scarcity of stuff around here. I'm glad that he's a God who knows how to continue to give every good and perfect gift. And if we were to go to Revelation 1 and 8, he says that I am the Lord your God, which was, which is, and is to come. As a matter of fact, in that text, it starts out that I am Alpha and Omega. Our God is the beginning and the end. This morning, my brothers and sisters, take courage as you get yourself built up to understand something. We serve a God and nothing moves him. Nothing changes him. If he made a promise, he is going to be there to fulfill it. There's a story that goes. There was a little boy who was eight years old. He wanted to go to a birthday party. And he just marked the day on the calendar. It was his best friend's party who only lived a two doors, a few doors down the street from him. Well, to his chagrin, when he woke up that morning of the birthday, a blizzard had hit their small city. Snow was coming everywhere. Winds were howling. It was that wet, heavy snow had fallen on the ground. Can you see it? Traffic had stopped up. Nothing was moving. But his friend called and said, I'm still having my party for a few people. He went to his dad and said, can I go to the party? And his dad said, uh, no, I don't think you ought to go out in this. And the boy just was so disappointed. And he went back to his room. And he was a nice kid. So his dad started thinking, it's only a couple doors down. And to his surprise, his dad knocked on the door and said, you can go to the party. This boy bundled up in his best coat, his mittens, and got his hat on, got his boots on, and he went walking down the block to the party. When he got to the party and they opened the door, he turned around and looked down the road. What? His father was turning around to walk back home. His father had been walking with him the whole time. I'm just here to tell you, in times in life, when you think you're alone, you're never alone. Because God made a promise not to change. My brother and sister, you're not alone right now. God is there for you and with you. And that's what this book of Hebrews is going to explain to us today. One of the greatest books in the New Testament. It's a book that we all know because of the Hall of Faith. It's a book we all know because of the promises that are in this book. But the reason for writing this book was because 
The writer, the author wanted the people of God to know, although the bottom is dropping out, although you're under persecution, although you're being persecuted constantly, you need to understand one thing. My God, you can depend on God's steadfast love to hold you up. And you need to know now that we have Jesus Christ, that this New Testament promise of God is built on stuff that will stand. It's not built on bulls and goats and birds and sacrifices. It's built on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Did somebody hear him say, it is finished? What are you looking for? Whatever it is, is already finished because that's the kind of God that we serve. So the challenge that this author had was to write to a group of Christians who had had suffering in the past and were suffering now. Sounds like us, don't it? And more suffering was predicted in the future. And he had to tell them what I'm tasked to telling you this morning. Hold on. God does not change. So this Arthur, we look at this book. Theologians don't agree on who is the author of the book of Hebrews. Some say Paul, some say not. That's not even our question this morning that I'm dealing with. But there are several things they do deal, they do agree on. The first thing they agree on is that this book was written to, written to Jews. And probably Hellenistic Jews because they understood the history of the children of Israel and how they became God's chosen people. They understood the sacrifice system is seen throughout all the books. So that means this was being written to someone who was not a novice. Sound like what I'm doing this morning. I'm preaching. How many messages have you heard already on holding on, be strong? You're not a novice. So I got, I'm taxed with telling you this morning, God hasn't changed. Everything else has but God has not hold on. And then we find out that he begins to tell us how from the opening line in this book of Hebrews, follow this book, why it is so powerful. And the second thing they agree on is that they were under persecution. Now there's no date or time as for how uh, when this book was written, but we do know there were several waves of persecution uh, that were done to, the, to our Jewish people where they lost everything. And this is one of those times. But Hebrews chapter 10, in the looking at this text, tells us that they were under persecution. The 32nd verse says this. And I like this 32nd verse of Hebrews chapter 10. Because what it does, it reminds me. Aren't we sometimes, when we first got saved, we're strong? We can stand anything. We can go through anything. We can handle anything. And we'll tell everybody, I'm saved. I live by faith. Seems like the longer we get saved, the weaker we get sometimes. The devil can just come and push us down. But that 32nd verse says, remember. Look what he said. Call to remembrance your former days when you were first illuminated, where you had a great fight of affliction. Watch this. And you endured every affliction that you went through. Come on. He was saying, remember how it was in your past. The Good News Translation says it like this. It said, in those days when God's light shone on you and you suffered many things and had a smile on your face and you decided, I will not be defeated. The 35th verse caps that off for where we're going today. It says, so... Don't cast away your confidence. All I'm trying to tell you right now is have confidence in God. Don't cast away your confidence. And remember who it is that brought you where you are. Because there's a great reward coming if you hold on. Listen, all I'm all saying is, this is not, can I tell somebody who's suffering this morning? This is not your first rodeo. This is not the first time your back's been against the wall. This is not the first time you suffered. Now, you may have done it in quiet, didn't tell anybody, but you made it. So quit fronting like you don't know that you got some battles behind you. This is not the first time you've been sick. So you ought to remember that when you were sick through some other illnesses, God helped you through. This is not the first time you've been broke. Lord knows we've seen some broke. 
And yet, during those times, wasn't God faithful? Even when you were broke, quit worrying about your economic condition. You have a God who understands and will supply every one of your needs. This is not the first time you've had a bout with no peace. Or can I say, this ain't the first time you had a bout with crazy. And even when you did, you got through those other times of crazy. Don't let this crazy time kill you. Don't let this time stop you. I know this is not the first time you had to, you were up all night or you had some struggles. Hold on, brother and sister. I'm being very serious now. And it takes 10 days. Hold on 10 days. Take 30 days. Hold on 30 days. You know why? Because if you don't change, my God can. Because his word says, God does not change. So the author, let's go to our text. The author in this text is first showing us how we got to this 13th chapter. It's only 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. But in the first book, he immediately talks about how Jesus Christ is superior. He's the brightness, the express glory of God, that he is the one who was prophesied. He talks about how Jesus is better. I don't even have to stop there. Because any true believer will tell you, if you have not tried him yet, isn't Jesus better to you, better for you, been better with you than anything else you've ever tried in life? The author expressed that in that first chapter in the introduction. He was saying, y'all, you just need to understand Jesus is better. Then he went through the subsequent chapters breaking down the Jewish faith, telling them what Jesus was better than. In chapters 2 and 3, I like that. He said, Jesus is better than the angels. Now, I know you love the angels. The angels were considered to be a great sign if an angel showed up from God. It meant you were in God's favor. It meant you were somebody, somebody. You remember when the angels stopped by Abraham's tent on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but before they did, they stopped by and talked to Abraham. You remember when Jacob was in the wilderness and he saw Jacob's ladder and it says angels going back and forth to heaven, coming back down. Jacob was somebody. And even our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, his birth was heralded with angels expressing who he was. So the Jewish people knew angels were special, but he wanted to tell them, yeah, that's nothing. Angels. Jesus is better than angels. You know why? Because the angels are God. And the angels are never entrusted in being able to control the whole world like Jesus is. Then he went from there to verses 5 through 7 to say not only is Jesus better than the angels, he's better than the priests. He said the priests were good because they did the sacrifice, but Jesus is the sacrifice. He was saying those things that they did would not last, but Jesus was better than priest. Matter of fact, he was not called from a priestly order. The Bible says in Hebrews, he came along after the order of Melchizedek. He appeared out of somewhere because of God's ordaining him to be a priest. Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is our great high priest. So you don't have to worry. He's better than all the other priests. He's getting these, getting these Hebrews to understand something. Not only that, but he's better than the whole sacrificial system. Put down your bulls. Put down your goats. Put down that bloody stuff. He already paid the price when he went to the cross. One time his work said it is finished. He finished the work. Then chapter 11, of course, is where we see all of these uh, biographies of those who live by faith that we are to follow. So he wanted the Hebrews to know you got to follow them. And then in chapter 12, that's the one where it says, be faithful. Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every week and every weight and thus sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's right, check it out. From chapter 1 to chapter 12, he laid out why you should know Jesus better. He laid out how Jesus was greater. He laid out how Jesus was faithful and steadfast. But then in chapter 13, through the first eight verses, all I'm going to tackle now, he now said, let me give you something now that you can apply what you just learned to your life. If this God is greater, he said, I'm going to give you 
some principles that you can practice to live a powerful Christian life. And he gave them what I have labeled the four L's. Oh, write it down. It is good. The four L's of a Christian life, of living a powerful Christian life. It's right there in the text. The first one is foster brotherly love. The second one is fight the lust or fight fleshly lust. Foster brotherly love, fight fleshly lust. Third one is follow godly leaders, the next L. And then finally, faithfully lean on Jesus, foster brotherly love, fight fleshly lust. Follow godly leaders and lean faithfully on Jesus, the four L's. Let's look at this text. You don't want to miss this. He starts out with, let brotherly love continue. He says, let brotherly love continue, which he is assuming that any believer already has brotherly love. And what he's telling us to do is to foster that love and display the love that God gave us. He said, if you're going to live a powerful life, then quit trying to love just those who are in those who are in your family or on your side or in your group. He said, the real strength comes when you can love others or you have brotherly, phileo love for those who are also in the body of Christ. The word foster is an interesting word. The word foster means to grow up, to make big. To support, to care for. You know when someone gets foster children, he's saying we're supposed to grow up in our love. We're supposed to be faithful in our love. We're supposed to allow our love to expand and abound. Love is the basis of the whole plan of redemption. Love is where Jesus got his power. Think about it. Because he loves us, he keeps us. Because he loves us, he forgives us. Because he loves us, he does not abandon us. When he was leaving here, he told his disciples, I don't give you a new commandment. This is an old commandment from the beginning. That you love one another. Watch the caveat. As I have loved you. Love one another. As I have loved you. But then he caps it off by saying, and this is the only way they'll know you're my disciples. If you love one another. You ever seen a mean, cantankerous, disgruntled Christian who say they love God but can't love people? I got news. It don't work. God said in his word, how can you say you love me if you can't even love those who are around you? You have to learn how to love because love is one of the most forceful and powerful weapons in the world. Love will make a man and a woman put their house up to save their addicted son. Can I tell you this? There was a son who was addicted to drugs. And he had gotten drugs from some dangerous dealers. Had not paid them. As a matter of fact, continued to use their drugs, try to sell the drugs, but he was, he owed them over $10,000. And the drug dealers had put a word out that we're coming to kill him. He was addicted using drugs, but he went out and took drugs and tried to be a drug dealer. And I want to stop here because as I was going through this story, it brought back to my, my recollection of how the funniest story and the most plausible explanation I heard that says an addicted person should not be trying to sell drugs. It only complicates the matter. It came from one of my dear deacons of this church, one of the most faithful, hardest working deacons of this church, Deacon Wayne Edwards. He has passed since then, but his memory will always live on from the kind of life that he lived. But I remember Wayne and I were riding, going somewhere, and, he, and we started talking about our BC days. 
Now, I know some of y'all don't have none, but, you know, to us who real, we got some BC days we can talk about. And we were talking about partying and drinking and getting high and staying out and folk who went to jail and didn't go to jail. So as we told this story, you know, he was talking about his fondness for getting high. Then I said to him, I said, well, man, you did all that. Was you ever a drug dealer? You ever tried to sell drugs? He said, no, emphatically. I was smart. He said, man, I want you to know, can't no monkey sell bananas? I fell out when I heard that because it is so true that you can't be in needing something that you're trying to sell and be addicted to it. Well, anyhow, let me get back to the story. That just came in. And this young man's parents got wind. They heard from their other child that the dealers were coming to kill him. They got the child to get together and they bartered a deal. They went and took a second mortgage out on their house to, get, to pay off their son's drug debt. And when the drug dealers, after they talked to them and they did this, they showed up. The father told him, look, I remortgaged the house. In a couple of days, we'll have your money. But the dealer said, no, we don't want to wait for our money. We want our money now. Without hesitation, the father walked over to a piece of furniture in the living room, grabbed car keys to his new car, and walked over to the dealer and said, look, you can have my car until that money come in. Just please don't kill my son. The drug dealer was so touched by this man's actions that he said, no, I don't need your car. We'll wait for the money. I can see that you love him. But you know what? Keep him away from us. But did you hear? There was so much love that this drug dealer was touched and said, I know you loved him. This boy was saved by love. Love will make you work overtime to send your kids to school. Love will make you apologize to somebody after you hurt their feelings because that's the reality of who and how love is. You can't say you love God and have no actions of loving your brothers and sisters. Our church would be so powerful. Church is powerful when brothers dwell together in love. Then it says, be not forgetful to uh, entertain strangers. That word entertain means be hospitable, hospitable to strangers. Here's what he's saying, that if you're going to love, it can't be just your clique. It's got to be, you got to entertain and love strangers with the same fire that you love your own people. Because you could entertain angels and not know them. And watch this. This is scary, but it's also literal because it's in God's word. It's actually saying that God comes down to test our heart by actually sending people by that need help that are really angels in disguise. And he wants to see if our testimony lines up with our testifying. And when you think about that, that's a dangerous thing. To have God do that. Now, some people say that that little, I just know that God has times that he tests us. It's almost like the story that if God was coming to your house, and if God was coming into your house, then you need to understand that uh, even though your house is clean, if you heard Jesus was coming over, you clean up a little bit more. As a matter of fact, if you heard Jesus was coming in, you watch what was on your television. You turn off uh, Tyler Perry's sisters. Mm hmm you turn off, uh, you know, one of these uh, reality shows. As a matter of fact, if you heard Jesus was coming over for a movie, you'd be hard-pressed to find a movie you like that ain't got cussing in it. As a matter of fact, you'd be sitting there, and every time a cuss word come up, you say, oh, Lord, Jesus, I don't know what happened. Look, all I'm trying to tell you is quit acting like you're perfect and learn to be hospitable if you have real love to everybody. I can remember a time when back in our early marriage, we were really tight and broke. We were living with my parents, as a matter of fact, in their basement, trying to save up enough money to get a place of our own, two small children. And one of them was in the hospital, not doing well at all. My wife had been sleeping there and staying with our daughter as they were trying to get her well. And, and I remember that I went to pick her up and it was already late. I was bringing her clothes and and she decided, you know, I, I talked to her into making sure she went home and got some sleep. Well, when I was coming at 7-Eleven, there was an old gentleman there. I don't know why God drew me to him. He had a cane. He could hardly breathe. He was standing there like he was shivering. And I said, sir, 
And I remember, you got to remember, this is when I was first saved. I, I had that spirit to help everybody. I remember I said, sir, um, what's the matter? He said, I'm trying to get to the bus station. So I took him to several bus stations locally, and none of them were open. None of them were running. And it hit me. I'm in Brixton, but it hit me. Drive him to Delaware. But the, the audience that don't know the, the area I'm talking about geographically, I, I would have to drive about 30 miles or 35 miles to take him to where he wanted to go. And it's getting later and later. So I remember going back by the house, picking up my wife, and I told her what was going on. And she said, okay, I want her to ride with me. We got in the car and we drove this man to Delaware, to the bus station, train station there. But nothing was opening until about 5 o'clock. It was, it was late by now. It was like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. But we wanted to get back home. So I remember driving down to a store. And I asked the man, are you good? You got money? You taken care of? I went into the store. And I told the owner, I said, can this man stay here? He's got money. You know, I'll pay for a cab if he needs it. But let him stay here because we got to get back. You know, we have small children. When I came back outside of that store, he was gone. I asked my wife, I said, where is he? She said, I don't know, isn't he over there? I said, no. He had disappeared. Not just gone where she couldn't have seen him, he was just gone. I looked at my wife and we were thinking. And this scripture came immediately to my mind how we entertain angels, how we had gone out of our way to help him while we didn't think anything of it. But look at the miracle that came. Our daughter, who had been going downhill, who was getting no better, got better. When we return back, don't tell me God won't reward us for entertaining strangers, for making sure that we have the kind of love that can bless somebody else. They're talking about love. Watch how you turn away from people. Watch what you say. Watch thinking, you know, uh, uh, like this next verse talking about uh, uh, love prisoners, those who are in bonds. This is literally... Watch out for those who are in bondage and those who are suffering. Sometimes we get to the point as Christians where we shake our heads. Uh, uh, uh. I don't know how they got like that. Come on, be careful. You are just one tragedy from having a mental breakdown yourself. You could just be one week away from having an economic breakdown. You could be one tragedy away of, of losing somebody that could make you lose it and you'll be a streetwalker. But we get to this point, I don't know how people get like that. And I remember, it may sound silly, but I used to think about people who smoke. Right on the side of the package, it says, it'll kill you. And I say, man, why do you keep doing that? And I'll never forget, I'm talking and thinking about this, and I, I just got a, a pack of those Girl Scout cookies, the Thin Mints, you know, the good kind. And I told myself, you know, I'm trained. I don't want to eat too many. I look up. I eat the whole sleeve. They come in two sleeves. I start tackling the sex, second row. And I remember looking and saying, I said I wasn't going to do this. Why did I do it? Automatically, God brought back to my mind. Now you understand. I'm talking about, folks, you got enough stuff you got to deal with on your own. All of us can fall prey to something, and we need to learn how to care about and love those who are less fortunate with a real love. Sometimes you say, well, I'll pray for them. There was this group of people went by to this farmer who was a deacon. They wanted him to go and lead them in prayer at this man's house who had an accident. And when this man had an accident, uh, he broke his leg and he had a large family and he couldn't work and they were getting bills and notices so they went, so the church got together they were all going over to pray and they stopped by the farmer's house and he said well look I can't go with y'all now because I'm in the middle you know it's, it's heavy season I'm getting crops out he said but I tell you what go on up to the house tell my wife to look in the freezer grab a pack of that chicken and, and grab a ham and and uh, get a pack of bacon out of the refrigerator, get them a couple of loaves of bread, get some canned food out there, pack them up with a nice thing, take that over to them. As a matter of fact, and here go $25, you could add and make sure they take care. That's all I can do right now. I can't stop what I'm doing, but that's what I'll do. And to his surprise, the people looked at him and said, uh, we were just going over there to have prayer. He said, well, he looked at them and said, what I'm about to say to you, he said, sometimes, the best prayer 
is to be the answer to the prayer and not just pray. Sometimes you got to be the answer to the prayer. We just want to pray for people and then let God do everything. God says sometimes you got to be the answer to the prayer. Reach out and help somebody. A, a prayer can't put food in an empty stomach. Take some food over there if you got some. Help them out. The problem with us is God said that is how you show real love. Fleshly lust. Verse 4. Marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. Poor members God will judge. Control your lust. The second L. First L, love. Second L, lust. Control your lust. What does that mean? God is saying I honor sex only in marriage. Now this is tricky. I'm not saying God will condemn you. I'm saying that you have to follow what the word of God said. I'm not getting into LGBTQ and same-sex marriage and all that stuff. All I'm telling you is what the word of God says is you got to honor the word of God. I'm talking about living a powerful life. You got to control your lust because God said that the bed of the married is undefiled and he honors sex in a marriage Bed. Now, now you need to understand something. I'll never forget that there was an LGBTQ person that joined our church. That's right. We let them come in, take membership, and we let the people come in. And these people joined our church. And as they joined our church, I didn't. We didn't put no special hindrances on them. But I continued to preach the word. And I'll never forget when one day she came to me and said, Pastor, I am so glad. That you don't condemn us like the rest of these churches do. And I'm so glad you let me be a member of your church. And you love us. And because he has said it that way, I had to say it this way. I said, now I need you to understand. I do love you. And you, and you are welcome in this church like everybody. But I need you to know something. I don't agree with everything you're doing. Oh my God. She got indignant, please hear this show, and said, that's deceitful. You had me thinking that you understood and that you agree with me and that you love me. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it. You better quit, no, 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 no. Quit whining like that. That's not true. Think about what you're saying. If I had to agree with every member that's in my church, I wouldn't have a church. If God had to agree, before I loved them, I wouldn't have a church. If God had to agree with us before he loved us, there'd be none of us saved. Because love supersedes grieving. Love looks over faults. So I didn't deceive you. I'm just telling you, I love you, but I got to stand on what the word of God says, and I will always love you. But don't worry about it. Nobody's perfect. Just keep listening to the word of God. And you will have to deal with that between you and God. But let me deal with the married folk for a minute. Married folk says the marriage bed is undefiled. That means what they're really saying is that God honors sex in marriage. And if I can put it in a James Duncan's translation, God loves sex. Because remember, 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 marriage was for several reasons. I know marriage was for procreation, and that's true. But also marriage was for pleasure. God made marriage pleasurable. Somebody want to challenge me on that? Come on, get out of here. You know that if every time you had sex, you got pregnant, you'd stop having sex. You knew that if every time you had sex, a child was born, I right now is I am going to abstain. The rest, I don't want no more kids. Hallelujah. So what am I trying to tell you? God has said sex is pleasurable in marriage. And because I'm going to tell you why, it's because sex is what consummates the oneness, our spiritual oneness, through what God was doing in our life. Lust. Let your conversation be without covetous. Watch this. I'm almost there. And be thankful with the things you have. Following the text. We're still on us. Here's what he said. He said, don't get caught up in money. You can't love God in money. Don't forget your purpose. Because God can make you rich, don't mean that you ought to take your focus off God and just want to be rich. 
No, God said, what you got to learn how to do is put things in its proper place and God can make you rich. Come on, somebody give me a hallelujah right there. Understand what I'm saying? We get caught up in wanting things because God gives us things. Then he can't give us things because we get caught on the things. There is a true story about a preacher who went to Atlanta several years ago. And he was looking through the phone book to find a restaurant. And he found one called the Church of God Grill. And he said, that's interesting. So he called the restaurant and said, I need to make a reservation, but uh, can, can, can you tell me how you became the Church of God Grill? He said, oh, yeah. We got a small little mission church down here that we had started. And at the church, we would sell chicken platters to, uh, you know, pay the bills, help pay the bills. And people really love the chicken. So we cut back on some of the church services and just start selling chicken. The restaurant started booming. After a while, we closed the church and opened up a restaurant. We just kept the same name, Church of God Grill. I know it sounds crazy and funny, but that's what some of y'all did. You got the name Christian, but your allegiance is to your things. You got the name Christian, but your allegiance to what can I get? God got to barter you before you even show up. You'll get upset if you don't have the things. And we got to realize it is sometimes the things that steal us and make us forget our purpose. So if you want to be a strong Christian, don't let the lust for things and the lust for sex kill your body. And you need to understand not only lust, but he said, follow godly leaders. I'm not going to stay here long because people will think I'm self-aggrandizing, but understand me truly. God said, everything I do works on order. There are some Christians who wear their rebellion like a badge. They, they, they don't follow leadership. And the text is very clear. It says, follow godly leadership. Follow, watch their testimony. Make sure their word, is, is their life is leading where they're going. And if so, that's who I set you to follow. But there's people that have cursed their own self by saying, well, I ain't, well, ain't got to do that. Uh, he put his pants on just like me or she. Who she thinks she is. Who he thinks he is. And we can't have any order. And God already told us, I'd rather have obedience than sacrifice. Think about it. You go to the Old Testament and you will see the children of Israel fell in the wilderness. You will see King Saul lost his kingship. Committed suicide because he tried to be disobedient to God and still be a king. Listen to me. All of us, you, me, all of us, go to the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphire. Soon as you decide, I'm not going to follow anything, you just lost your way. And that disobedience brings in bitterness and it takes you to a place where God cannot help you. All of us, myself included, have to remember that we can't be rebellious to God and expect his blessings. I know this part is hard. Don't turn back. Listen. Remember the man with the one talent? He buried it. And he was kicked into outer darkness. Why did he go to outer darkness? He didn't go into outer darkness because he did anything wrong. He went to outer darkness because he did nothing. Because he had a gift. And he decided when he was going to use it. And God said, no. If you got a gift that belongs to me, you want to have a powerful life? Follow when you don't feel like following. Follow where God has placed you. Follow God in leadership. I'm closing. Brotherly love. Watch the lust of your flesh for things. Make sure you don't come so rebellious you don't follow leadership. But here's the end of it all. Jesus Christ, the same Yesterday, today, and forever. Here's the shout. Don't keep climbing the ladder of success and get to the top and, found, and find out you had your ladder leaning against the wrong building. Many people have done that. They've turned other things into gods. And they have 
forgotten that the only sure foundation, the only thing that doesn't change, the only one who could take them through is Jesus Christ. He always has the same power. He always has the same mindset toward us. He always has the same love. He always wants to get you out. He's always interested in how you're hurting. He's always interested in how you're suffering. He's always there when you turn around. After you walked away from him, he'll still be waiting when you turn back to him. He's always there to pick up the pieces. He's always there to love you when you're unlovely. He's always there to build you up and bring you back and help you out. Whatever you need, the only person you can count on to always be there is Jesus. Somebody ought to realize you tried everything else, but he is the only one. And the reason he's been so faithful is because he's the same. He doesn't change. Yesterday. You trusted him yesterday. You can trust him today. And forever, whenever you come to your senses, you got a God that don't change. And they would tell him in the book of Hebrews, the author was letting them know, you got to live. Here's some practical principles. Love. Fight lust. Follow leadership. And lean on God. The four L's of a prosperous life. I know I'm over time, but I just got to tell this, and I'm done. There was a young man about to be sentenced to the penitentiary. The judge was shocked to see this young man in front of him. And he looked at him and said, I know your father. Your father is a legal scholar who has wrote great books on the law. Do you think he'd be proud of you right now? And the boy didn't say anything. He said, I'm asking you, do you remember your father? The boy said, yes, I remember him, Judge. And the judge was about to pass sentence, and he said, you know, I know your father well, he said, and I just need to know, how do you think your father would, would, would react to where you're going right now? And uh, Don't you know what I'm saying? Do you even know your father? And the boy said something that the judge never expected. He said, yes, I know him. He said, I know that when I came to him for advice, he was writing one of those legal books you were talking about. And he told me, get away from here, boy. I got to finish my book. And I remember when I went to him needing help. And he said, look, I'm about to start this other book. And then I got to go. And so you knew him as this great legal scholar. I knew him as lost, as a lost relationship. The judge said, won his life, but lost. His family. No trade off. Listen to me. Has God been knocking? And you say, get away from here, God. I'm busy right now. I got to finish this. Has God been coming to you saying, I know how you could be better, but you say, Lord, I don't want to hear you now. He was trying to lift you out, but you didn't have time because you wanted to lean on something else until you fell through. This is Pastor Duncan saying, please take this message. Understand what the Lord was telling us this morning. The four L's to a powerful life. And remember, God does not change. God bless you. Have a great day. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with a new way up and I needed some help. Everybody but not living, just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free I tried it for myself and 